we're going to continue with the theme of blood flow and in this lecture we're going to focus on blood pressure. Now in the last lecture we mentioned how it was useful to have the velocity or the speed of flow to vary in different regions of the body to allow either in the case of the large vessels fast transport and in the case of the small vessels slow exchange. You can play a similar game in a consideration of blood pressure. You want to inject the blood with high pressure to propel it through the body. That's what the heart does. On the other hand, capillaries are really fragile structures and in those regions it would be beneficial to not have a high pressure um, because then you would be risking blowing out those very delicate structures which you need to be delicate in order for thin exchange surfaces to facilitate chemical diffusion. So in this lecture we want to consider what governs blood pressure and we're going to address this question. What causes blood pressure to vary in different regions of the body? Now you can instrument the circulatory system with pressure measurement devices, pressure transducers. And if you put pressure transducers in large vessels and small vessels, then you can map a pattern of pressure. And so what we see on this graph is we're going to look at these different regions, but we're also going to consider how pressure varies with time in those different regions. And we've already talked about how the left heart generates these large oscillations in pressure. That's what the Wiggers diagram illustrates. And then we also consider what happens in the aorta and the other major arteries of the body. And there we saw that there's high systemic pressure, essentially the left ventricular uh, systolic pressure um, is reflected in the major arteries. But then the puzzling thing is that the diastolic pressure is higher in the aorta than it is in the left ventricle. And that's a little mystery that we have yet to address. Then the pressure drops exactly where you hope it would. But before it arrives to those very delicate capillaries, we have a big drop in pressure. And that low pressure is maintained through the veins. And it's not until the blood reaches the right heart that we begin to see an increase in pressure again, but again, we lose that pressure as the blood flows into the capillaries. So this is a very complex pattern and it requires um, a consideration of different physical principles to understand. Now, first you might be asking, well, when I go to the doctor's office, they only give me two numbers for blood pressure. How does that relate to what I'm looking at here? So you put the blood pressure cuff on your arm and you get two readings. Okay, the high one is the systolic pressure and the low one is the diastolic pressure. And because your arm includes a major artery, then this is reflecting the pressures that uh, would be measured in the aorta or pretty close to it. So the systolic pressure does correspond to what the left ventricle is generating. Uh, the diastolic pressure, however, is reflecting what's more in the aorta, not what um, occurs in the heart. All right, so under, to understand this pattern, this regional difference that we see in pressure, let's again return to a simplified model of blood flow. And so we're going to look at another, like we did in the last lecture, cylindrical blood vessel. The scale of this vessel matters for this principle that I'm going to describe. Uh, this applies to small vessels like capillaries, arterioles, other small vessels. Blood is viscous. It has a stickiness to it. So honey is a very sticky, viscous fluid. Water is less viscous, but has viscosity. Air is also a fluid. We don't tend to think of fluid for gases, but they also have viscosity. Um, you know, air is less dense and less viscous than both blood and water, uh, but it operates by similar principles. So when we talk about the respiratory system, a lot of the principles I'll describe now could be applied to airflow in the lungs. At any rate, the viscosity of the fluid means that 
some amount of the fluid, you can think of it as a very small layer, will adhere to the surfaces that it encounters. So if we allow this bolus of blood to move rightwards into the capillary, what we find is that the layers of fluid that are closest to the walls of the capillary stick to the capillary. And this is a very sort of rectangular appearance. The actual uh, flow of blood is much more continuous, but it's drawn this way to illustrate how the closest layers have less displacement than the layers that are furthest from the walls, right in the center here. And that's because of viscosity. So this layer that's closest to the wall is partially sticking to the wall. It's also stuck to the next layer and therefore slows it down. And then that happens at the next layer and so on. So the further from the walls you get, the more displacement that's achieved and also the higher the flow velocity or displacement over time that's achieved. So if we change this schematic into the flow velocity vectors that we would predict, then what we see is this parabolic profile in velocity. So this shape is reflecting the viscosity of the fluid. It also depends on the radius of the vessel. The smaller the radius or diameter of the vessel, the more of the volume of the fluid uh, that's in close proximity to the walls. And therefore, the viscosity has a greater effect when you've got a small diameter vessel. So this flow gradient is created by viscosity. We're going to designate viscosity as eta, which can be measured. Um, and another observation here is that if we were to monitor the pressure in this little bit of um, blood as it travels down the capillary, is that the pressure would decrease. So the upstream uh, end of the vessel has a higher pressure than the downstream end. The pressure difference is related to the viscosity because the viscosity and the, the vis viscosity essentially makes it so that the fluid sticks to the walls and which slows down its motion. So you're going to have more of a drop in pressure for a particular flow rate um, if you've got a higher viscosity. So we can relate the resistance created from viscosity to the pressure with this relationship here, where delta P is the drop in pressure down the length of the vessel, and it's equal to the flow rate, okay, that's a volume per unit time, times the resistance, the resistance that comes from viscosity. Now we can unpack that resistance, that R term, even further. So we should expect that it does depend on viscosity. And in fact, that's the first, viscosity is the first variable in this relationship. Okay, so resistance is proportional to viscosity, if that makes sense. What else does it depend on? Well, the dimensions of the capillary. So if you have a really long capillary, there's more opportunity for viscosity to act on the fluid. So the resistance increases with length. It's directly proportional to length. The radius also matters. And here you would expect you're going to get more resistance with a smaller radius of the capillary, right? Because you've got more of the cross section coming into close proximity of the walls in a small vessel. So you might predict the resistance is inversely proportional to radius, therefore. But in fact, if you do the calculation, a consideration of the fluid mechanics of a viscous fluid through a cylindrical vessel, what you find is that the resistance is inversely proportional to radius to the fourth power, okay? So that turns out to be hugely important because for any small change and your body can change the radius of many of its vessels, for any small change, you get a huge impact on resistance, which in turn can influence the pressure, right? Because a small change in this little lowercase r, which is say you decrease that a little bit, that's gonna cause a big increase in radius, 
which in turn, if the flow rate's constant, is gonna cause a big drop in pressure. This relationship that relates viscosity radius to peripheral resistance is known as Pousset's law. And Pousset's law is gonna be really important for us when we consider how the autonomic nervous system controls vessel diameters to either influence pressure, the blood pressure, or to control where blood moves towards in the body. So viscosity is the reason why radius matters. If, if this was an inviscid fluid, a fluid without any viscosity, then radius would not be so much of a problem. Another point I wanna make about viscosity is that it causes a loss of energy from the fluid. Now pressure, which has the units of joules or millimeters, of, I'm sorry, not pressure. Um, energy has the units of joules. Um, pressure is equal to joules per unit volume. The joules per milliliter uh, gives you a pressure. So what that means is that we can think of pressure in terms of the energy content of a fluid. So the reason why in this context we've got a big pressure drop here as the blood flows through this capillary is the viscosity all along the way is robbing the blood of its energy. And that's what's reflected by the drop in pressure. So we can say that viscosity causes, first of all, the radius to affect resistance, that's Pousset's law, and this loss in pressure. So now we get into what the nervous system can take advantage of here. Because of Pousset's law, the fact that radius really matters to peripheral resistance, now we have the opportunity to manipulate that resistance. And that comes um, at this scale of the circulatory system. So what we have here is a bed of capillaries in an anastomosing network. That means a network that separates and then comes back together again. And what we see here is blood that's oxygenated and red and then becomes deoxygenated as it exchanges with cells uh, on the venous return here. Now, this Pousset's law applies to small vessels. Now, the capillaries are, only have a single layer of, um, a single cell thickness to allow for lots of diff um, chemical diffusion. So we don't wanna go at controlling the radius at that level, but instead it's the arterioles, which is the next level up in scale from the capillaries. And it's at that level, the arterioles, that we see smooth muscles wrapped around the vessels. Aha! So smooth muscles allow for the control of the diameter of those vessels. Okay, so let's return to our graph of pressure as a function of uh, position over um, the body. So um, we, we have in the heart these regions of high pressure generated by the muscular contractions. We see large oscillations in this pressure. Uh, so pressure oscillations are created by those muscular contractions. Then we have the drop-offs in pressure that occur in the capillaries. That's because of this high resistance that's caused by viscous dissipation. Again, a loss of energy. As soon as that energized fluid starts to get pushed through the really small vessels, then viscosity acts on it and causes the drop in pressure. All right, so that explains a lot, most of what we see here. What it doesn't explain is this business of the pressure being elevated in the major arteries, even when the left ventricle is relaxed, okay? So why is it that the diastolic pressure is so high there on the graph? Now the answer to that question can come from an, an examination of the mechanical properties of the major vessels. Here we have uh, a histological section of an aorta. And if you really know your histology, then you would identify uh, lots of collagen fibers here. These wavy uh, fibers are molecules of collagen this is in the relaxed state. If you were to uh, put this in tension, then all of these fibers would straighten out uh, like 
uh, the molecules in a rubber band. The aorta is rubbery and elastic. So as it becomes pressurized by the left ventricle, the walls expand like filling up a water balloon at a high volume. The tension in the walls helps maintain the high pressure in the fluid. And what happens is that as the semilunar valve closes during ventricular diastole, so when we have this big drop off in pressure, that closes the semilunar valve and therefore insulates the aorta from the left ventricle, seals it off. When that occurs, the aorta remains inflated it, with its elastic walls. Those elastic walls maintain that tension to keep the pressure elevated even when the left ventricle is relaxed. So if we look at a, at a uh, longitudinal section of the aorta, it would look something like this, although it would be expanding in diameter all along its length because it's all being pressurized during systole. So it expands in its diameter during systole, but even during diastole, the walls remain in tension. So we have a systolic pressure where we maintain um, that high pressure through the tension in the walls. And yes, it is higher than during diastole, but even during diastole, we maintain tension in the walls. Okay, so the answer to this mystery, this question mark about the elevated diastolic pressure comes from considering the elastic walls in the major arteries. They serve to maintain this high diastolic pressure. And that largely explains the spatial pattern that we see in blood pressure. But it also allows us to consider a conceptual model for how the circulatory system works, at least on the arterial side of things uh, with respect to pressure. So we have from our last lecture, this conceptual model for how the heart works. And for that, we were modeling the chambers of the heart as um, a syringe with a piston. And as we push on the piston, that's gonna elevate the pressure much like uh, the muscular walls of the ventricle. Um, the um, atrium would be somewhere here feeding the blood that enters into the left ventricle. Now it exits through the semilunar valve, that is the blood, which serves to inflate the major arteries like the aorta, which we're modeling as a water balloon. Now on the output end of this system, we have all of the branches of the circulatory system that ultimately get down to the level of the capillaries. So we're gonna start off just modeling that as one uh, vessel right here. So the left ventricle, as it contracts, elevates that pressure and sends blood into the major arteries, thereby inflating our water balloon. And then it relaxes like that. So the pressure in the left ventricle has those large oscillations like that. And then we see the same peak in pressure in the aorta where you've got that high systolic pressure that's really driven by the left ventricle. During diastole, we have the semilunar valve separating or isolating the major arteries from the left ventricle. Okay, so now this elevated pressure or this maintenance of pressure is created by the elasticity of the aorta. But then another feature here is that the peripheral resistance, that is the resistance to blood flow in the smaller vessels also plays a role because just imagine the high pressure in the major arteries is gonna drive blood flow into those smaller branches. If there's high resistance to that flow, then it serves to maintain tension in the major arteries. Now we can track the effect of peripheral resistance on the blood pressure, and it's helpful to, rather than um, just considering all of these values, it's quite often helpful to take an average of them. And you can do that if you had a recording of all of these numbers, you could take the mean of all of these numbers. Um, but something that physiologists will often do is, since this uh, systolic and diastolic pressures are so easy to measure, then you approximate the temporal mean, and that's known as the mean arterial pressure. 
which uh, you can calculate with this equation right here, where MAP, the mean arterial pressure, is uh, the diastolic pressure plus, so that's the minimum here, plus essentially a weighted uh, value. So we take the range, the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure, and we take one third of that. And that gets us um, a pretty good approximation of where the mean arterial pressure lies. Okay, so that's our focus here. What do we have to do or how do the different features of the system affect the mean arterial pressure? Now one way, since we've established Pousset's law as being so important in influencing peripheral resistance, is to add arterioles to the circulatory system. So we're gonna slap in some smooth muscles there, which allows us to change the diameter of our vessels. Vasoconstriction causes a really large increase in peripheral resistance. Now that means that, that blood is gonna flow from the major arteries at a slower rate. Okay, that high resistance means less flow, which maintains pressure during diastole. Okay, so it's gonna result in a higher diastolic pressure. And we can track that in the graph up above where we have the systolic pressure there. Since that's driven by the left ventricle, we achieve the same systolic pressure, but we maintain that more during diastole when there is um, high peripheral resistance. Okay, so we get a higher mean arterial pressure because of what happens during diastole. And of course, there's not just one blood vessel that emerges from the major arteries. We've got a whole bunch of them in parallel. And so um, when there is systemic vasoconstriction, that is vasoconstriction through most of the body, then you get this elevated uh, mean arterial pressure from that systemic increase in peripheral resistance. Another thing uh, we've already considered uh, and we'll see more of in physiological systems is localized uh, vasoconstriction. So if you have local vasoconstriction, you're causing there to be greater peripheral resistance in just part of the circulatory system. And since you have a whole bunch of uh, vessels that are in parallel, um, that means that resistance is high relative to the rest of the system. So you have relatively low resistance in these other two vessels. Again, three vessels is totally unrealistic as well. This is just a simplified uh, model. If you've got lower resistance in these other two vessels, that means the blood will preferentially flow through those paths of least resistance or lower resistance. And that, in fact, is what you see is that you have higher blood flow where there is lower peripheral resistance. We saw this in the case of thermoregulation. When your skin is exposed to cold temperatures, then blood is shunted away from your skin. And that's because you have smooth muscles around your arterioles in the skin, which cause vasoconstriction, and that increases their peripheral resistance, with, which then favors blood flow to remain in the interior of your body. So this is known as shunting, and blood is shunted towards the vessels with the lower resistance. Okay, so we set out to address this question of what causes blood pressure to vary in different regions of the body. So we see, this is old news, but the left ventricle generates that high systolic pressure the aorta maintains a high diastolic pressure through its elastic walls, and that is influenced by the peripheral resistance, uh, which is controlled through the smooth muscles and the arterioles. And then finally, we have a loss in pressure due to the viscosity of blood, and Pousset's law illustrates how um, you have a tremendous amount of resistance in the small vessels High resistance due to viscosity also causes a loss in energy, which is reflected as a drop in pressure.